One of the lesser known stats is that 50% of women get no access to mentoring. And yet for many people in careers and in running a business, it's actually pivotal in how they progress. And it allows them to fast track, you know, as opposed to doing trial and error, which is incredibly slow and tedious and expensive. It allows them to get to meet the right people and to get into different roles. And so I think a lot of women don't feel that they're as deserving of mentoring as many guys will just go and ask for it. I've definitely found that women don't like putting their hands up and saying, I'm struggling, I need help. Whether it's from a parent, motherhood question, a business question, a career question, they just sort of almost have this ability just to go, I'll do it, I can get this done. Why do you think it is so hard for, especially women, to reach out and ask for help? One of the things that we see, particularly with a lot of corporate women, because in organisations it's shown as a sign of weakness and because it's so competitive, you don't want to be the one to be seen to be down. Lisa, welcome to the Career Confidence Podcast. I am very excited to have you here today. Very excited to have somebody that also lives quite local as well. I know you're Surfside, Geelong based from our previous chat before the podcast. So it's good to have you on the podcast today. But um, look, We've had a chat off offline, which was fantastic, which is why I wanted to get you on the podcast today. But for those that don't know who you are, don't know about Business and Heels, um, can you just give a little bit of an introduction to who you are, your background? Uh, so Lisa, over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Georgie. It's great to be here. As you say, it's rather nice being down on the surf coast. Um, so I'm the CEO of Business and Heels, an organization that's been running for almost 10 years. And we are all about empowering women in business, business, both business owners and professional women, to help fast track them on that road to success. So we do that in four different ways, mentoring, education, connection, and marketing. And today our collaborative community sits at 200,000 spread right across Australia. And we also work internationally in the UAE and Malaysia, and we're just busy setting up in Europe. So. Um, how did I get into this um, amazing role? Well, I started off my career largely. Um, oh, I did agricultural science, didn't use it, went into a career in retail um, and ended up in an amazing job of being a buyer, which means you get somebody else's credit card to go around the world with and spend money and buy clothes. But um, that that's the glossy version of it. It's not nearly as, as pretty as as that, but um, then you get to go and place a lot of product, and there is a lot of pressure to buy clothing, and it's fun. it was a fun job. Uh, and through the course of that, I actually ended up in China, and so very early on, when I first started traveling, China was not the country that you would know it as today. It was very um, much everybody just wearing Mao suits and riding bicycles and. Uh, nobody spoke much English and I was found myself in a factory in the middle of nowhere uh, ordering printed leggings because that's what we bought in those days and um, talking to the people and through an interpreter uh, was my first exposure to the one child policy uh, and to be honest it never had occurred to me at that point I had rose tinted glasses on and thought women were all equal and that everything was rosy and um, and here were all these people making choices uh, about whether they could support a girl child or a boy child, and they actually had to make a decision based on their future retirement that um, they would choose that having a son would be more likely to maintain them in their retirement. So they were abandoning girl children all over the place, and so babies were found on the street outside shops and things. So. It was my first exposure to ever thinking that women couldn't earn as much as men and I was really shocked and more than a little bit horrified. So it really started me thinking and I guess I didn't know where it was going to lead at that point. But it really started me thinking, are women less equal than men? And I guess everywhere I kept turning, I realised that women were getting ahead, um, that women were often, um, you know, for many different reasons, not getting the opportunities or the pay. and so. I guess throughout my career, I've been a little bit of a champion for the underdog wherever I got 
a chance. And I guess, you know, one of the things I often believe in is if you can make a difference, you should. Uh, and I guess that's part of why we wanted to set up Business and Heels. Wow, what a story. And um, I actually got goosebumps um, when you were saying about the the choice about a, a boy child or a girl child and all the babies being left on the street. It's just absolutely horrific um, that this happens in our world, but unfortunately it does and we can choose to turn away or we can choose to look and go, I want to do something about this. And that's the path that you took, which is just so honorable and so inspiring. So look, and it, it's really funny. I think like when I sort of reflect on my own journey as a female, my own career, my own sort of um, experience setting up a business, it's not until later on in life that you actually realize, God, actually things have kind of been not stacked in my favor. And you don't sort of like realize, and then when you reflect, you go, hmm, that's interesting. Oh, that's interesting. And I'm starting to realize now from speaking to a lot of other female entrepreneurs and women in C-suite and leadership roles, actually just how still challenging it is to get ahead as a female, to be paid equally, to be respected, to be seen as an equal. And, you know, this is part of the reason why I have podcasts and I have people like you on it to just to talk about these issues. So let's, let's go back to business in heels because what you're achieving, the community you're building is incredible. So how did that Take me back to the the journey of starting up that that business. You had the passion, you had the why. What was that sort of all those sort of lessons early on from starting that sort of community? Mm, that's a really uh, good point, Georgie. And I think one of the things that we first realised. So I started the business with a business partner, and we first realised that we didn't know many people outside of retail because that was our background, and so instantly discovered that our network, whilst vast within retail, was very small in the line of the greater world out there. So we had to get connected. Um, and it's one of the things that many women fail to do is to get connected beyond their immediate role, beyond their company, beyond their industry. And so I was unusual within retail because I was very well networked. Uh, but externally I wasn't so. And so having to go out and start networking again wasn't comfortable. And again, I think many women find this exactly so. And I walk into big chambers of commerce and be greeted by a sea of suits and you're sort of thinking, okay, so who am I going to talk to first? And how do I get away when they get start selling me something, right? And so, you know, and you don't want to be that person that's selling things. And so one of the things we worked out quite, early on was how to actually teach people to do this confidently and to get away from being salesy. And because of my background, all partnerships and stakeholders were nothing new to me and we've we learnt quite early on to build collaborations. It's a lovely way for women to grow. Um, and it was quite interesting because women and men do business a little bit differently. Again, that was another good learning curve. I'd spent most of my business career doing business with lots of men, but it's something that I realise that many other women struggle with because quite often men want to just start doing business and we'll work it out as we go along, right? So it's like getting into bed on the first date. But for many women, they actually want to know, well, I don't really want to have first date with you. I don't know anything about you. Who the hell are you? And do I trust you? And, and all the rest of it. So trying to get people to understand a little bit of that and to work out how to do a compromise. I think it's been quite valuable um, as some of the lessons that we learned. And so we started off very much around networking and realised that people needed some education along the way. And after we um, did a lot of work on um, the education piece, we actually realised that mentoring was probably the education go works to a point, but unless you can actually talk to people and understand what intrinsically motivates them or doesn't, it's very hard to help people to shift their mindsets. Um, and so that's where we realised that mentoring was really important. Um, and one of the lesser known stats is that 50% of women get no access to mentoring. And yet for many people in careers and in running a business, it's actually pivotal in how they progress. And it allows them to fast track 
you know, as opposed to doing trial and error, which is incredibly slow and tedious and expensive, um, it allows them to get into, to meet the right people and to get into different roles. And so I think a lot of women don't feel that they're as deserving of mentoring as many guys will just go and ask for it. And so trying to uh, get some of this message across. So we had, we set up mentor mornings then as a result of that. And we run it in five locations now. And it's an opportunity for any woman to come. It costs about 20 bucks and they can sit with an amazing senior leader or a business owner and just have a chat for an hour. And it's amazing because quite often, you know, it can solve a problem. It can help them explore something. As you mentioned, as a business owner, it's often really lonely. And many of the stuff that you touch, you've got no idea what that, what you're doing. And so asking an expert is great and getting pointed in the right direction and maybe the things that you should consider. Um, so mentoring is very different from coaching because people then share their experiences with you. And sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. And so that's where mentoring can be really valuable. And so that was sort of some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. Um, and we continue to grow and evolve and change things. Um, at the moment, one of the things we're working on is also about helping people with difficult communication problems. You know, in many organisations, people are being asked to do more and more and more. Uh, and it includes often uh, telling people they no longer have a job or trying to um, pull people up for bad behaviour, very uncomfortable things. And so we're working on a program which we can take in with actors so that in small groups, people can actually practice this um, with difficult, belligerent, aggressive, you know, whatever emotion it is that you really don't like dealing with, you get the opportunity to do a bit of a practice so you can start embedding some really good techniques. Mm. It's so funny that we're talking about mentorship because this keeps on coming up over and over again on the podcast. And like a week ago, I actually interviewed, um, the, one of the co-founders, Lucy, of Mentor Loop, and we had a whole conversation about why mentoring is so important in your career when you're starting a business. I even had Janine Ellis on a few weeks back, and she was saying she would not be where she is today without the mentors in her life. And she's gone on to build Boost Juice, which is one of the you know biggest franchises in in Australia, if not the biggest. And I think one thing that I've noticed. Um, a lot, especially about women. And I'm sort of speaking for myself now as well, is that we struggle to ask for help. And I don't know why that is, but I've, I've definitely found that women don't like putting their hands up and saying, I'm struggling. I need help. I don't have the answer to this, whether it's, you know, from a parent, um, parent sort of motherhood question, a business question, a career question. They just sort of almost have this sort of ability just to go, I'll do it. I can get this done. And actually, if they just put their hands up and said, oh, I just really need some help or I'm not sure, there's so much power in that. Why, why do you think it is so hard for, especially women, to reach out and ask for help? Well, I think that there's a number of intrinsic reasons behind it. Um, one of the things that we see, um, particularly with a lot of corporate women, because in organisations it's shown as a sign of weakness to ask for help, um, and because it's so competitive and there is an attitude of, you know, if you're, you know, if you don't want to be the one to be seen to be down. So women who are in corporate don't like asking for help and nor do they um, necessarily come into the uh, running a business, if that, that's their background, asking for help. Now, we've got a lot of women that are starting businesses at the moment in their 40s and 50s because they're a bit disillusioned about corporates and wanting to do like a values-driven business. And what, and many of them are experts in what they do, right? So they've got amazing knowledge, amazing expertise. But many of them struggle admitting that it's not in everything. And why would it be in everything? But because they feel like they're selling themselves an, as an expert, then they need to be seen to be an expert in everything. Um, and so the sooner we can get people... Uh, realizing that, uh, then the faster they progress. But it's something we see quite quite a bit of um, coming out of corporates, particularly. Uh, and the other side of it, it's often a family thing. You know, don't ask for help. Uh, depending on your cultural background, it's not deemed to be appropriate. 
And so quite often it, you know, it's a heritage thing that people grow up with. Mm. I really just want to move away from the narrative of it's it's a weakness when I actually think it's a strength. And I and the thing is as well, going back to mentorship, people think that they've got to have everything figured out before they can sort of start mentoring others. And actually sometimes you just need to be a few steps ahead of somebody else that, you know, might be you might be you might have just gone through that same situation or struggle in your business or your career. And someone could say, Oh, I'm not sure about this. And then you could say, Oh, I actually just went through that a few months ago. This is what I did to get out of it. So you don't even need to have like, you know, don't need to have built a eight, 10 figure business to, to mentor others, you could literally just be sort of as well, just a few steps ahead and then keep on pulling people with you. And I I think we would have a lot more female entrepreneurs, a lot more women in C-suites if we all had the attitude of just like, make sure that we pull a chair next to us as we're continuing to progress as well. That's, that's, that's what I would love to see. But look, I am so passionate about female leadership, female, entrepreneurship, females in business, but I'm also so curious and I'm trying to find the patterns and the the reasons why there's just not enough women in leadership roles and starting businesses. Do, what What's your thoughts and opinion around this? Like, is it our society? Is it, is the world set up to support women? Is it because some women don't want to have, you know, like you know a lot of careers if they're they're more sort of wanting to stay home with the kids like what what do you think it is that why aren't we seeing more women step up into c-suite leadership roles starting businesses because the stats are so low it's scary yeah it's an interesting one why why don't we have a look at um the corporate side first because i think um there's a lot of stats so 26 percent of women in senior leadership and that has not shifted much in a decade uh, and so they're actively trying to get more women into the C-suite. But uh, when you go down to um, a lot of the criteria, it's often set so hard that it's very difficult to get women in. Now, you look at the government at the moment and they've set targets of around the 40-40-20, and they're getting there because they're opening up that um the ability to have different parameters of, of what people are expected. For instance, um, I know when they first recruited for Bow and Water, they used to always have the CEO being an engineer. So it had to be an engineer and you had to do various things. But it's a CEO role. So yes, they're overseeing other engineers, but that's not the only thing that they do. There's a lot of community engagement and whatnot. So then they started recruiting for a CEO who, who could organized stuff rather than and be visionary and be a real leader as opposed to somebody who had that specific background and I think more and more that's a good example of how more and more organizations are tackling it to bring in people with more rounded skills um, which opens the door up for more women but one of the things that really stops women in organizations is that many of them don't take on profit and loss responsibility so when I was running big sections of the buying office, I had profit and loss responsibility. But often when you look at many organisations as, as generalists, the women are, are centred around the HR function or marketing, which means that at the end of it, they're still not managing P&L. And in order to be taken up to the C-level, they need actually to be managing the profit and loss. So... Uh, it's one thing for women to actually actively look at that. And I think, again, with mentoring, a lot of them are then getting um, a career path. Sponsorship's another really great method within organisations to get women exposed to some of those important areas that they need to be in order to be a likely candidate for the C-suite. So um, there's a few interesting things there. Um, another thing that you touched on, which I thought was really interesting, which was around mentorship and the caliber of people. I think it's really interesting because um, not always is the most senior person the best mentor. Really great mentoring is about helping people get 360 degree perspective on the problem and the challenge that they're facing or their life or their career desire. So often people will come to you and say, look, I I need help to get a promotion to this role. But when you dig into it and you really find out what they want, 
it's actually not that role at all. It's something else completely different. But because they're taking the logical path, they come to you with this. And if you're a senior person, you're busy, you're solution driven, right? So what you want to do is help them get on their own, you know, whatever quick way to solutions is what they're on about, because that's, again, how they're trained up. But a really good mentor will actually spend a lot more time understanding the why and then helping people to see what that why could lead to before they jump into solution mode. And I think that's probably something that um, can happen at lots of different levels, but I think people really need to be trained and to have the proper frameworks. And I think one of the things that's really um, to be aware of at the moment with so many people suffering from mental health issues is a very fine line when you're mentoring people or coaching them that may fall into that line. People need to be really clear about what they should do so that they're not um, uh, doing giving people the wrong information. If they need to have seek professional help, that's where they should be sending them. So, yeah, I think that mm. it's uh, quite an interesting thing. So, again, back to your question about why are they stepping up. So there's a couple of things as well. Um, you know, 30, so a recent study just came out to say that there were 30 unpaid hours for every woman across Australia um, in what we're doing wow. in all the other stuff, right? So think about a 40-hour week and you've had on and on then this, well, in a highly um, competitive corporate job, it's what, a 60-hour week or a 70-hour week, maybe an 80-hour week. And then you add the 30 hours of unpaid work that women are doing on top of that for their kids and everything else. And it becomes a bit untenable. So I think there's more people trying to get that balance. And hybrids helped a lot um, for both partners to take more responsibility. And, and because we do the Gender Equity Awards for Australia, we're exposed to a lot of what the best companies are doing. And now you're really starting to see parental leave um, and more and more people sharing that, which is leading to better outcomes. So maybe in the pipeline coming up, we might see a bit of a shift because of what's happening now. But a lot of the women that um, are older, obviously, um, are getting no benefit from that whatsoever. Mm. There's so many layers to it, isn't there? It's like I, yeah, I'm so, I always, when I have these conversations, yeah, it's very complex. But you've made some really good points that, have, that I haven't thought about before. One of them was around the finances. I think that's, so for example, for me, right, I used to be, I have. To, I had a story that I was so bad at maths and because I was bad at maths, that meant I would be terrible at finances. And that actually put me off starting a business for quite a long time because I thought I can't, I can barely count to 10. How am I going to manage the books? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? But actually what I came to realize is that finance and maths are they're really completely separate. I just need to make sure that I've got enough, you know, money coming in. I can pay my payroll. I can do this, do that. And actually, you know, once your business gets up and running, you can pay someone else to do that, which I did. Right. So I can just, as long as I get the financial statements, understand them every month. And I've upskilled myself in order to do that and got a mentor and sat down with a bookkeeper to explain everything to me. Um, as soon as I did that, I thought, oh, it's not as hard as what I thought, but I had a story in my mind that said, I'm not, I'm not good I'm not good at maths, therefore I won't be good at finances or that's just too hard basket. So I think that that advice around the finance piece is really important because once you understand profit and loss and balance sheets, they're not as complex as what people make out. And sometimes I think companies and people put these barriers you know, in place to be like, no, this isn't for you. This is too hard basket. And actually, if I can get it and I can barely count to 10, trust me, <laughs> so can everybody else, <laughs> right? So that was really good. That was really good advice there. But again, it's being aware of the stories we tell ourselves. Um, and then I loved what you also said about as well, like how sometimes the best mentors aren't the most, you know, aren't the people that have got tons of experience and they're the ones that really under, that can ask questions and really un understand people's why and, 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 and be curious, I guess, about other people. And then the whole point you made about the 30 hours unpaid work, Wow, that is just 
and, and I reflect back to like when my mum, so my mum didn't work that much, but she worked part time. But when she came home, her, her job didn't stop. She, you know, she was cooking dinner, she was cleaning, you know, my dad was working full time a lot of hours, but still like she still put in so many hours to keep the house together to make sure my, my brother and I were well fed and looked after. And people don't see that but it is, it is ultimately still does in most cases fall onto the woman more often. Um, so yeah, I think maybe that little bit of a balance in the household could be key. And look, a, a lot of men are actually stepping up, which is great to see. But it doesn't stop. So once women get mm. children out of the household, often in conjunction with it, they're dealing with aged parents thereafter. And so quite yeah. often there's then the next round of things to to manage so uh it's it doesn't sort of have a an end date so you often see it was interesting through COVID that many women shut down their businesses because they had such big caring responsibilities both for their parents and for their kids um and you didn't see that at all it was the first time that women starting businesses went backwards the prior to that women starting wow. businesses was the fastest growing stat and that was through COVID, we actually saw that go backwards. And many of them, of course, then lost a lot of traction and were unable to pivot and, you know, have since closed their businesses. So it's been quite an interesting thing as a result of um, all those different caring responsibilities. Mm. Really, really interesting. And like I said, you know, we're not going to sit here today and ultimately solve this problem. But I think what what it's what it's important to do is be aware of it. And I love that you're doing like the mentor the mentorship mornings and getting women together, supporting one another. Because as we said, entrepreneurship, running a business, or even just being in a leadership role, it can be lonely. It can be really like isolating and you just feel like, you know, am I doing, am I failing? Am I doing things right? And maybe you don't have anyone to talk to. Um, but you also said something that I am very, very aware of, especially at the moment of that whole mental health piece. And I honestly think this has been some of the ch most challenging years for so many. We've gone from COVID, we've gone into, you know, a recession, cost of living, mortgage rates going up, people, you know, especially the industry that I'm in, which is technology, like people have been losing their jobs. It is, it has been a lot. 2023, I think people have described it as the year where they were barely holding on for, for and surviving. Certainly not many people have been thriving. So when, as somebody that I'm sure mentors a lot of w women, when it, when should you sort of suggest to somebody that maybe get some psychological help alongside mentoring? Like, are there some sort of warning signs that we can look for when maybe we need that extra little bit of support outside of just a mentor? Because I am speaking to a lot of people right now that are really struggling and I want to help them, but I'm also kind of want to say, look, I can only sort of do so much. And what I'm kind of suggesting is that they go to a professional. So wh where's the blood? Where's the lines here? Uh, a lot of the lines um, are around once, you know, people are, are having some serious symptoms, you know, they're not sleeping well, they're, you know, tired and um, very irritable and you're seeing real mood swings and things like that. So um, as opposed to, I'm just worried about one thing and often it'll be many things layered up. So, you know, they're starting to talk to you a lot about their family problems as well as their work problems. You know, it often will give you some indication that um, maybe they need a bit more more help or they're behaving a little erratically. Um, again, it might give you a clue that... And, and you can say quite often, so, so say somebody starts talking to you about something that, you know, you're just not equipped to deal with and it might be a very personal family thing, you can say to them, look, you know, I really appreciate you sharing this with me, but I really think um, a professional um, would be best to talk to you about this particular circumstance and just park it rather than trying to address something that you, you're way out of your depth on. Mm -hmm. A hundred percent. I just think stress is just, it's just the biggest issue in our society. And I, again, it's that I've dealt with a lot of stress myself in my own life and I've certainly got some, 
some really good practices now that I can use some tools that I, that when I feel myself sort of overthinking or getting a bit like tight chested, I know I can, if there's something going on. I know that it's not the problem. It's, it's something that's, that's happening underneath. And I, I feel like if you can st- strip it all back and get to the actual cause, that's where you sort of regain your power when you go, ah, okay, that's what's causing it. Okay, cool. I can, I can look into that. Why is that? But yeah, we all, I, you know, I've had, um, seen a therapist in my, in my time and it really, really helped identify a lot of things that were holding me back as well, because, you know, I think, and I'd love to get your um, thoughts on this as well, Lisa, but I think we can do a lot of like personal development and growth and we can go and start businesses and we can do all these things. But if something underneath is not addressed, if we've got unresolved issues, if we've got like some trauma, some a lack of self-belief, something underneath, if we don't address that, then it's literally like doing all this personal development, business training, and just pouring it into like a holy bucket. We're never going to grow if we don't have strong foundations, right? And that was the probably the key piece missing when I first started my business is that I had all the motivation, but I hadn't addressed some things internally. So how important is that when you talk to like any sort of entrepreneurs, but to, to really understand yourself at a deeper level to really sort of start your business or start your career or, you know, do whatever you want to do with those solid foundations in place of really knowing who you are and not having everything figured out, but just that strong base. Is that important when you sort of think about, you know, growing something of sub- of substance? Oh, look, absolutely. But I guess, um, you know, people still grow and change as, you know, life goes on. So that's a big part of life regardless. But I think being a business owner is not easy. Um, and I guess at many points, because there's such a gamut of things that you need to ha- handle, uh, unless you're really good at pulling in people to help or uh, you'll f- you'll come across something that will really challenge you. And I guess it's at that point of um, adversity that you discover whether you're wise, strong enough or not. Um, and for many people, you know, we often talk about, you know, the why is the thing that keeps people going. Um, so quite often, you know, people that are motivated by a quick buck um, don't hang around because it's just, it gets too hard. But at the end of it, um, you know, it's very rewarding if the why is really important to you. So I guess that comes back to your point about foundations. Uh, it doesn't mean you necessarily have resolved everything. I think running a business gives you a great insight into yourself along the way as you come across all these different things that you didn't know about Um, and as I said you don't know what you don't know so it's great to talk to people and say oh you know how did you tackle this or you know and there's lots of people out there that want to collaborate Uh, and I think once people learn not to sell at people every time they meet them that's a real trap for new entrepreneurs uh, is to to find those people that they want to collaborate with then life is good and it's very easy to grow your business. Let's go back into like the the corporate world now because obviously I I come from a recruitment background, I have a recruitment business and I'm doing a lot of work with women especially in the technology sector and working with all the companies who want to hire more females into their business and constantly saying to me we want more diversity we want more diversity and my sort of first sort of question back is like well what's your culture like is it set up to for women to to succeed or you know because there's diversity is one thing inclusion and belonging are two separate things and what I often say is that get that right first and the diversity will come because people talk if it's a toxic environment it's going to get out people are going to join you leave you so get those foundations right in your sort of business and culture first but would you have any advice for businesses HR people business owners in general to to, to get that piece right? Like how can we support women um, in the workplace? Is there any sort of things that you sort of see that sort of what we could be doing more of to really set women up for success? So how long have I got, Georgie? <laughs> Lots of ideas <laughs> here with you. Because we run right, the Right, let's hear them. Awards. Let's sort this out. <laughs> because we run the Gender Equity Awards and we did that because we wanted to find out what the best practices are. Um, the moment we've got 49 finalists and there's a plethora of best practice out there. And so 
making, you know, as you say, getting the inclusion piece right. But what we're seeing is making it a great place to work where people feel like that they they can be themselves individually. So if my problem, you know, if my if I'm feeling less included because I'm LGBTQIA plus or am I from a different nationality or am I disabled? Those people um, are fight are what we call an intersectional group. And where that crosses with gender, it's even tougher. And so I've been exposed to all sorts of things like the bamboo glass ceiling and um, different different challenges. And so organisations that can cope with any individual, right down to their pets, you know, so everyone's got different needs and demands. So if you can feel like you can go to HR and say, anybody, you know, I want to work my, my work this way, I'm going to be hybrid here or I'm going to be fully in the office there or whatever and have them accommodate you, then you're far more likely to stay in that place. So part of it's fulfilling your personal needs. Another part is about making sure that you've got other people that you might associate with or affiliate with to talk to. Um, So it's that diverse community. Uh, We were just talking to, I did a great interview on Friday with um, Coulter Legal and they were finalists and winner of last year. So they have a policy where people can go away on parental leave and they will still stay in the promotion line. And so two of them have been promoted to partners whilst on parental leave, which is really unusual in the law industry to have um, that happen. And they've come back part-time, which is even more unusual. So that constant accommodation to keep your experience allows the pipeline to continue to grow rather than people feeling like they'd have to leave, which is what we would have seen years ago, that they would have been away on leave and come back and be probably somebody would have been doing their job, being paid more than they are when they come back. So that's what we see a lot of. And so I think policies like that attract more and more people. Um, The tech industry could do a little bit more to market itself that they need these skills and not as techie people. People still have an image of the computer geek in the basement for tech. Um, and we recently did the leadership summit for women in tech and cyber. And cyber is kind of like where tech was 10 years ago and there's still like only one woman in the room. But it's the fastest growing sector and their biggest needs is around cons and, and communications people because they're the people who have to work with the customers when there's a breach. And it, like when you hear it, it makes sense. But when someone talks cyber, I imagine somebody off there cracking a code in, you know, in the back room trying to find the hacker or whatever yeah. it is, right? But that is not where most of the jobs are. So I think there's a lot of people in industries that are not performing so well that would do really well in the tech and cyber sector um, but are not seeing the obvious thing. And that this comes back to women wanting to tick every box. So if you said to women, are you good at project management and you're great at organisation and you're a good communicator, blah, 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 then you can go over to the tech sector. There's nothing stopping you because half the big companies are willing to pay to reskill you a little bit because they're desperate for people. And so, you know, we need to be able to pick people up and transfer them over. But they're busy thinking, okay, I work in this particular industry and I need to tick every box. Um, Otherwise, I'm not going to be appropriate. Uh, I need to have experience within that industry or I won't be appropriate. So I think there's an element where we we need women to be a little bit more lateral and think a bit bigger uh, and take a few more risks, which is probably a little bit more masculine trend than a female trend. But um, something that would certainly help get more women into those industries. And I think if we then dialed it back to school and actually got them to understand, again, the reality of what those industries are like, again, I think many kids coming through at the moment still have similar pictures to what I was describing earlier of those industries rather than the reality of it. And so unless, you know, we can get more of those people in schools and get career counsellors more across what these fast-growing industries, because this is where all the jobs of tomorrow are going to be. 
Um, and it's exciting right. times to get in there early. So if we could get more mm. girls um, exposed to that, it's not even mm. on their top 10 list of desirable things. You look at what girls are thinking of between, you know, even a decade ago and still doctors and nurses mm -hmm. and teachers are right at the mm -hmm. top of the list and you're just like, well, at least doctors are up there now. But it's like, wow, <laughs> mm -hmm. how do we shift this thinking? I, I, I am so pleased that we have, we're speaking about this and this is part of the reason why I actually did start this podcast because I believe you can't be what you can't see. And the, the perfect example of this is I recently did an interview with a woman called Moan and she went from being a nurse into cybersecurity. And what she came to realize is that she was working with all these machines that actually hackers were trying to hack every single day. And if they did, it could literally lose a life. So she just suddenly started like spiraling and she started researching. She started speaking to a couple of her friends who are in technology. And she came to realize that she's got so many transferable skills. But like you just said then, Lisa, it's the communication piece. It's the way you go about delivering news and you know, you, you you're managing stakeholders. Well she's managing patients that you know are on their deathbed like nothing's more harder than telling somebody that they're they've got a diagnosis and looking after them than dealing with somebody who I'm really sorry but you know your system just been hacked like far easier conversation than what she's been doing as a nurse right so she's able to communicate work so well with the with with non-techies with stakeholders she has gone on to have an incredible career and she is just working her way up so quickly um and earning fantastic money and having lots of freedom to support her family. And it was just case in point of everything that I've been preaching and talking about that we need to do a better job of painting a better picture because I completely agree with you. It's like, even from the younger generation, when I was growing up and that was many years ago now, but tech was just like not even an option. It was like beauty therapist, teacher, nurse, definitely not a doctor in my time, but they, they were the options for me. So, social worker, that was it. And I think also what we need to do as well, and this comes down to like the parents as well, because this is this is the thing that I'm sort of like finding a bit is that parents sort of like are reluctant to give their children technology, right? And I understand that and I would be the same. However, I think we do need to accept and surrender to the fact that technology is a part of our lives. And actually a lot of tech is really good. It just, we don't want them on TikTok and Instagram and Facebook, no. But what we could be doing is giving them you know, um, games and, um, you know, switches and things to, to sort of test their problem solving skills and their, and just get them interacting with it in a way. But I think people think phone, social media is not the case. It's like, you know, we can actually be giving them technology and exposing young girls, especially to technology from an early age and maybe sort of showing them products or, you know, websites and saying, do you know what? This is tech. This is tech. This is tech. This is tech. And getting them to understand that everything we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis is technology and it is the future. It is the future of jobs. And my fear, Lisa, is that if we don't get this right over the next decade, we are going to fall further and further behind and the gap's oh. going to just get bigger, not smaller. So that's why I'm so passionate about making sure that women do consider careers in technology because it is the future. Full stop. Well, I totally um, agree with you. I think part of this problem comes back, though, to parents' fear and control. And um, hmm. recently I was chatting to someone at Optus uh, and they had, I had come up with a solution. So when you set up your broadband at, at home on an Optus system, you've actually got a kill switch for the kids. So you can actually switch them off out of hours off the internet. So... Um, you know, I just thought that was such a cool idea because then, you know, it's about, as I said, it's about control. You need to give them exposure, as you say, because otherwise they won't keep up. But again, it comes back to understanding and control of the situation. And most parents, if they could do that, would be delighted because then they know between the hours or whenever they said, you've got to go to bed and when you're getting up, they can't access anything. So as I said, it comes back, there's, there's going to continue to be solutions. As we continue to throw up problems and challenges like this, there'll be workaround, you know, there's, there'll be the next interesting thing. So 
tech is here to stay. I guess the, the Optus uh, disaster we just had she highlights how dependent we are on it. <laughs> so yeah. it just goes to show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know. I was like, oh, great. I'm running a business. I can't call anyone, can't email anyone. This is fantastic. Um, but yeah, it was a bit of a shock because I thought, God, this is how much we now rely on this. If, if the internet went down tomorrow, I'm screwed. <laughs> Quite literally. You know, I can't read a map. You know, I'd be absolute disaster. Um, but look, I, I'd love to sort of go into now um, around <laughs> like confidence and self-belief because when I've called this this podcast career confidence for a reason, right? I do believe that having some level of self, a level of self-belief in yourself and your abilities is crucial to, for any level of success in life, whether that's starting a business, working your way up a career ladder. But I also appreciate that self-belief and confidence doesn't come naturally to many people. And that's potentially a learned behavior. Maybe you've not ever been around women, especially that did believe themselves or were confident. So people say to me a lot, Lisa, like, how do I go about building confidence? And my response is, well, it comes from first courage to put yourself sometimes in uncomfortable positions and stack the evidence that you then can do what you say you're going to do. But how important do you think that whole self-belief confidence piece is when for, for women especially and young girls in your experience? Oh, look, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. And I guess to your point, um, it's about learning to ask. And, you know, you, you talk about imposter syndrome and things like that. It, every time you change jobs or move up or grow, it's uncomfortable because you're trying new things. Um the people of tomorrow, the tech-based people, are all curious. Curiosity is a great skill to develop. So pushing through uncomfortable is a great skill to learn. And I guess what we need to do is have mechanisms there to encourage and to reward people for trying, not not bashing them over the head for failing. And I guess that comes back to having great inclusive environments where people are encouraged to have a go. And, you know, part of growth is actually trying and failing as well as trying and succeeding. So you've got to keep trying in order to get, like you have to get a number of no's before you get yeses. So everybody's got to learn to go through this. And I guess it's a, it's a skill. So it needs to start at the school level. You know, I think there's a lot of spoon feeding of kids. We don't, you know, everybody gets a prize. So, you know, we need to... <laughs> Uh, get kids to understand that they need to try and they won't always succeed and part of learning confidence and courage is actually going through the difference um so I think there's yeah it's a big it's a big part of it but what we need women to do is stop sitting in isolation and internalizing everything and the more they can find other people to chat to about this whether that in their organization or not or in their immediate circle or not, the more help they can get. I mean, it's really interesting in the school system in Europe now, they've actually set up like self-help groups in every class. So each week there's at least a couple of hour sessions where everyone can bring out different problems and everybody works on them to help them, right? So having a problem is not, is normal, right? It's not a, you've got a problem, you know, you're a problem person. It's something that we all face and that they all work on together. And it creates this mass community idea of, well, we just keep helping one another. So it's back to that village mentality of it takes a village to support people, um, which is nicer than perhaps where we've ended up letting people feel more isolated. So, But everyone has Mm -hmm. the option to take it in their own hands. So uh, for those of you who are feeling confident, you know, reach out to someone who you can see is looking a little bit left out. Uh, and if we did that, it would be even better. 100%, that whole coll- collaboration piece that we spoke about at the start. But, I mean, you've touched upon so many amazing things, but just going back to that school example in Europe, like, honestly, like, if, if, if school had actually been better <laughs> I probably would have stuck around and not left at 16, but I just remember just thinking like, I am not learning anything here of value. I remember being in maths, (laughs) remember I can't count to 10, but having an argument with my, learning algebra. And I was just like, 
what th- this is just not I know that there's no place in my life that this is going to be beneficial I just knew it's just like why am I sat here having this conversation but you know I think that the school system god I mean that's a whole different conversation itself but it really does need to be shooken up and we're still educating children like I mean, I remember I didn't have a computer in my school, you know, and things have changed and adapt so, so much. And I would love to see things like that, like, you know, problem solving groups come together because problems and struggles are a part of life. Um, you know, struggle is inevitable. Pain is optional. I love that quote because it's like struggle is going to happen in our life, right? Full stop. But we get to choose how much pain we get from the struggle. And that's where I think people go wrong is because they haven't come up against these problems before, because maybe they've been wrapped up in cotton wool through the education system, through their uh, helicopter parents, whatever it is, being given a medal for coming eighth place. So well done, you just showed up. No, like life's not like that. You've got to set people up for success. Life is tough and it's going to get tougher. It's going to get more competitive. It's going to, you know, require resilient people coming into this world. And I don't see that much resilience, unfortunately, coming into the workforce, especially, which is quite concerning. But look, I don't want to generalize, but from a few conversations that I've had, I do, I am concerned that there is a bit of a lack of resilience um, in certain people coming through. And I don't have the answer to that of why that could be, but I've got a few thoughts, but I think it does also come down to the schooling system and you know, it's, it does need to be changed. And I love the fact that that school in Europe is now having problem solving groups because that is going to set people up for success in the future when they do come up against things that are tough. Because it's, it's that's actually life, the standard you know? for the Netherlands. So the whole country works that way. Um, and it just goes to show um, Netherlands and Sweden are, you know, leading, leading the way as far as gender equity goes. And just they've created inclusivity and in diversity from very early. And so I think they started with the ads and you've probably seen it where the kids get to pick up all the balls and they all put them in the jar and then one gets a bigger jar of lollies. The, first, the little girl's looking at it going, wow, I've got this jar of lollies and looks over and the boy's got more. And they're like, oh. And so eventually he gives her some more back. And so they've been going on it for now almost a decade. So it's be really interesting to see, you know, like how that translates into society. Mm. Very, very interesting. Lisa, I could sit and talk to you all day um, and we could debate so many issues in our society and probably get quite fired up. But what's what's next for you and Business and Heels? Like, what do you want to achieve with that? And, you know, obviously you've achieved so much already, but what is next for you in that business? So we continue to roll out. Um, so we're doing a lot more around diversity and inclusion back into the workplace through both mentoring and workshops. And um, the latest one is more actor-based uh, type role modeling, which people can play with, because I think at the end of it, if we want to create some of that resilience and help people with retention, that that's really important. Um, and we will obviously continue the Gender Equity Awards for the next year. And we are working on um, moving business and heels into Europe as well. So that's exciting. Uh, And we just continue to try and help women in business solve some of the problems that they're facing, you know, whether it be a cool new app or something that can help make them a little bit more productive and just take lessen the load a little bit if we can. Incredible. Well, I look forward to following your journey and hopefully coming to one of your mentorship mornings. Um, I'd love to be around some other incredible women and mentors and ask lots of questions and and come away feeling inspired. So you'll definitely catch me at one of those. But where can I send people to find out more about you, Business and Heels and all the amazing work you're doing? Uh, look, if you go to www.businessandheels.com, you'll find us. Uh, there's lots of interesting things for business owners. There are lots of education and uh, amazing uh, interviews and inspiring comments and books and things. So that would be the best place. Incredible. We'll make sure we put it all in the show notes bef- uh, below. But Lisa, thank you so much for your time today. It's been amazing chatting to you. 
Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you enjoy these episodes, the number one thing you can do to help us grow and keep spreading our mission and message is to hit the subscribe button. And if you have time, give us a quick rating. I appreciate each and every one of you who tune in every week and we look forward to bringing you many more episodes this year. Take care.